Good evening, my name, or good afternoon, good evening. We're right on the cusp of just change here in the time. Uh, my name is Mike Lucan. I'm the executive director of Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. Tonight, uh, uh, we're, we thank you for coming to our meeting on uh, Placer's regional transportation challenges and needs. Uh, tonight, we also um, are honored to have uh, a member of uh, the Auburn City Council and a member of our Board of Supervisors here uh, to give us a, a short introduction and, and be with us tonight. So why don't we um, start off, uh, Supervisor Gustafson, would you like to say a few words of introduction? Okay, well, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who's attending. I know throughout my district, I hear a lot about transportation issues and the challenges there. So thank you for tuning in tonight. And I am the supervisor for the fifth district, which encompasses Auburn and parts of North Auburn as well, all the way up through Lake Tahoe. And then councilman or council person Amara, sorry. No problem. Uh, good afternoon, and my name is uh, Sandy Amara, and I'm the council member for Auburn and also the vice mayor for the city of Auburn. And would you like me to say a few words now or? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited, and uh, I look at this as an opportunity for us to share and listen uh, to our priorities and our needs and our um, in our uh, projects for, for the Placer County. Um, as many of you know, or have experienced, traffic is rapidly returning to Auburn and the North Auburn area. And we need to act rapidly and in a strategic manner. As you know, um, you know, the right transportation infrastructure will protect our quality of life and it will keep Placer, including Auburn, moving and flourishing. And so we are excited to have this discussion today about our priorities and how we can make them happen. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone and thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Great job, Sandy. And I'll, I'll pick up with a couple things um, to add to that. Um, we've been working on some really key projects in the Auburn, North Auburn area, such as the Highway 49, Re rehabilitation and the upcoming sidewalk gap closure projects. We've also been working on how to maintain our streets better, our roadways, improvements to trails and many others. But it's a very important part of that process that we get your feedback and your priorities uh, and work together to find ways to get these projects implemented. And that's really the purpose of tonight. We know that being here to, that we're here to listen and to contribute to that conversation. And we know that listening to you and hearing your ideas and suggestions will help result in a plan is most responsive to your needs and to your community. So thank you so much again for being here. And I'm excited. I know council member Amara is too, to hear your feedback when we get to that section. Thank you. Great, and thank you, Cindy and Sandy. Um, we uh, have a lot of information for you tonight. And uh, first I'll do is I'll introduce our staff members who are bringing this to you. Um, myself, I'm the executive director of uh, PCTPA. Um, we also have uh, Aaron Hoyt, a senior transportation planner on our staff. Um, and then also Kathleen Hanley, our associate uh, transportation planner. Um, she'll be handling some of the logistics tonight and we may, uh, we may ask her a transit question or two as well. So, um, so that's, that's, our, that's who, uh, who is going to be bringing you the material tonight. Um, we also, uh, so in terms of what is the material that we have, our agenda, if you will, for tonight, is to first talk to you a little bit about traffic. Um, traffic, as you know, um, uh, went down to a very negligible level during the pandemic. And so Aaron's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, how traffic has returned uh, here in Auburn and in the rest of the county. Um, we're going to talk about then I'll talk about impact fees and kind of the role of builders in the transportation process. That's very important to understand that, um, uh, you know, when you build something here in the community, um, you, you certainly um, have to um, mitigate the impact of the, the um, 
traffic that you create. And Aaron's going to talk a little bit about um, how that works, um, you know, uh, kind of take apart our traffic uh, model update that we're in the middle of right now and also explain how those impact fees work. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about uh, what are our regional projects and uh, um, mostly focused here in Auburn, but I'll also talk about some other projects because, as we know, we move about uh, quite a bit throughout the county uh, every day. And so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the South, South County projects as well, because they certainly affect uh, when we go down and shop down in the South part of the county as well. Um, and then we'll wrap it up again, like I was talking earlier with a, a Q&A section. So if you don't have a chance... So moving on to the next slide, um, before we kind of get going here with Aaron's presentation, um, I want to tell you a little bit about PCTPA and, and why we exist. So PCTPA, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, we, we have one of the longer names of any agency here in the county. Um, but we are who we are is we, we are a special district. We're not the county. We're actually not the cities or the towns, but we're a special district created by created by the county and by the cities about 30 years ago. And the reason we were created is, is something that's very important, uh, at least I found in my career here in Placer County, um, is, is local control. Um, with other transportation agencies in the Sacramento region, sometimes you, you're not able to control, you know, where you, where you, you know, where the roadways go, uh, where you where we spend money on roadways um, and other priorities for our transportation system. But in Placer County, we have an agency that and that is us um, that was created to do that. And so we don't have people in in Davis or West Sacramento or Sacramento, you know, telling us what our priorities should be. We get to do that right here in Placer County. And we've we've done a pretty good job at it. And uh, we've we've been very successful in our projects. Um, that we, and you'll find out a little bit more about them tonight. We've been able to deliver all of our not most, but all of our projects on time. Uh, ahead of schedule or, or, or on schedule or on budget uh, throughout our entire career. And so we're, um, we're working very hard and, and trying to be good stewards um, um, for your taxpayer dollars right here in Placer County. And then the second little bit about us, uh, if we go to the next slide, is a lot of people ask, well, well what, do you, what do you, how do you plan for transportation from a geographic standpoint? If, 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 if you're, if you're name it, you're just Placer County, do you just look at Placer County? And as we talked about earlier with the, the polling question, a lot of us commute to other places. Well, a lot of us move throughout the region. Uh, and this is a slide of the what we term the Northern California mega region. And it's actually an economic region um, um, for Northern California that includes the Bay Area, um, the Sacramento metropolitan region, which is six counties, including Placer County, and then all the way up. Uh, and all the way up to, uh, to Reno. And so we, we look at this mega region first and see where people are going. Um, and then we focus inward. Then we go down to the six county level in, in SACOG or the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. And, and there's a metropolitan transportation plan that looks out in the future for transportation needs for the entire region. And then we focus in on Placer County and look at what's important uh, to Placer County. But this slide, again, we have we have 82,000 people that commute outside of, from Placer to Sacramento County alone. And then we have other people that go, you know, what are called super commuters that even commute every day. Uh, an example of that is uh, the Auburn Station where we have the Capitol Corridors. We have people that commute every single day to the Bay Area via train. And so, uh, you know, it's very important that when we plan our transportation system that we look at this, this bigger picture, but again, focus our priorities right here on Placer. So the net first part of our presentation tonight is uh, going to be uh, about traffic. And uh, Aaron Hoyt, uh, on, on my staff, our senior planner, um, is going to talk about what are called travel trends or, or traffic. Um, and he's, we're going to take a look at the you know, during the COVID period and after the COVID period and kind of where are we at uh, as right here in Placer County. So Aaron, why don't you go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mike. And as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, you know, CDC came out today with the uh, notice that we don't have to wear uh, masks indoors if we've been um, vaccinated. But, you know, beyond that, there's been a number of other positive markers that have happened over the course of the last several months. Um, some of our high schools and elementary schools are back full time. Uh, we had a return of high school sports, uh, baseball, football, soccer. There's a number of those positive things that are occurring as well as indoor dining has came back. So we're slowly moving back to a new normal. But one of the things that's probably changed the quickest during this time is traffic. So next several slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about how traffic's returned, 
um, what we're seeing and kind of what we anticipate um, in the coming months. So this chart here is from an analytics and data firm called Replica. And what uh, this chart shows is how traffic, how actually the vehicle miles traveled by resident in Placer County uh, for an average weekday has changed since March 2020 uh, up until January 2021. And what it shows is if you look at that blue line on the left side of the screen, right about midway through March 2020 was when the first day of home order occurred. There's a dramatic drop off in traffic. So we went from about 18 um, vehicle miles per day all the way down to maybe about 12, 13. And then that traffic ebbed and flowed across uh, the remainder of the year. We saw another dramatic drop off in November and December when the second stay at home order uh, occurred. Um, and we're down by the number of uh, miles traveled by about 50% from where we were back in March, 2020. As soon as that second stay at home order was lifted in early January, traffic volumes went back up to about 20% of what they were previously. So a very quick return once that second stay at home order occurred. I'm going to focus on um, Highway 49 next. We actually have some uh, traffic estimates on Highway 49 uh, to kind of uh, give us a better idea of how things are going on locally here on um, in North Auburn and the city of Auburn. So these two charts here show um, the traffic volumes on Highway 49 as well as the speeds. And these are in the area of Palm Avenue on Highway 49. And what we're looking at here on the left chart is traffic volumes across the day on an hourly basis. And we can see how traffic volumes have changed from 2019, 2020, and 2021 for the month of January. What um, we, I start to notice first is the blue line representing 2021, it, it doesn't have that sharp increase um, that we previously did back in 2019, 2020, because we had so many more commuters back then. A lot of uh, people are working from home these days and still remain working from home. And so that uh, blue line doesn't see that sharp increase in terms of the amount of traffic we're seeing early in the morning. But where we do see things change a little bit is you get into the late afternoon, early evening, we see a lot more traffic occurring um, during those times of the day right now. And that's probably because of the flexibility that people have. Um, it may also be because less people are taking transit um, than they were before. And so we see more people on the roadways and we're getting close back to where we were back in 19, 20 um, and 20 uh, during the middays. But right now, traffic volumes in the Auburn area on Highway 49 are about 20% of what they used to be. Um, and we can also see that the speeds at certain times of the day are actually higher than they were before because of the, because we have less congestion and less traffic than we used to. Um, you will notice that the um, blue line for speeds is a little bit lower than things used to be in the off peak hours, um, you know, from midnight to about six. And that's predominantly because of the construction, the work that's been going on along Highway 49. So um, with that, we do anticipate though, as people go back to work, um, commuting starts to occur again as offices open up, that our traffic volumes are getting very close um, back to where they were. And again, these are numbers as of January, 2020. So I, I've been out on Highway 49 recently and uh, it seems like it's worse than it was before, but that's also partly because of the construction that's going on. I'm gonna move over to Interstate 80. Um, it's kind of our last kind of focus on traffic. And traffic on 80, uh, down as you approach State Route 65 is where these numbers are gonna come from. It, it's a little bit different story. There, traffic's about 10% of where it, where it used to be um, prior to the pandemic. So um, a little bit different. Um, Interstate 80 does collect a lot of other travelers who are going um, through the region or even coming from different locations within. Um, the North Auburn, the Meta Vista area, Forest Hill, and coming into the Sacramento area. Here we see um, much similar, similar features of what we saw on Highway 49. That is that for 2021, the blue line is not as sharp or nor as high as it is in the AM peak hour for 2020 and 2019. Um, again, we don't have the commuters going to work anymore, but our midday Traffic volumes look very close to what they do uh, or did back in 2019 and 2020. And here, these charts are showing I-80 eastbound and I-80 westbound right around State Route 65. Traffic speeds also um, during most of the day are higher than they've ever been because we don't have the congestion that we used to. Um, but you do still see some dips during those uh, more congested time periods during the morning and evening. So with that, I'm going to pause. Um. 
All right. And uh, our next topic that we're going to talk about is um, our travel demand model. So that's the traffic model that we're doing right now. And we haven't updated that uh, for the county in, a, in almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're in the process of doing that now. And that determines what improvements we, we need or it confirms what improvements we're working on. And then again, this role of, of builders and uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the process of paying for transportation improvements through a thing called impact fees. It's, it's a bit of a uh, mystery to some folks. Some of you may know uh, a lot about it, but uh, Aaron's going to try to demystify it a little bit tonight and uh, and show you how uh, how um, things like impact fees play into funding our transportation improvements. Thanks, Mike. One of the uh, more challenging aspects of delivering transportation projects is just finding the funding. We um, often cobble together three, four funding sources, sometimes even five to six because grants um, at both the federal and state level sometimes will pay for certain elements here, while other grants will pay for things there. Um, and, and it's really hard to uh, garner a lot of transportation money just from one source. So we'll often see many different sources. And one of the ways that we do fund our transportation is through impact fees. Impact fees are really just the fee that new development uh, pays regardless of the type of land use it is, whether it's residential, commercial, or warehousing, and it's based on the amount of traffic that those new land use developments are anticipated to generate. These transportation um, or these regional impact fees are very similar to what each of the cities have uh, throughout Placer County as across the state. They all um, are really part of new gross impact on the existing infrastructure. And what we mean by that is if a facility is working just fine, but a new development um, comes on board and the traffic that is gonna to add to that adjacent roadway essentially breaks it, makes it over capacity or uh, makes traffic at a left turn lane at intersection extend beyond that turn pocket. That's what we consider breaking it. And that development would be required to uh, improve those infrastructure. But if there's something that's already broken, we, we really can't have those developers pay for the entire thing. They're only required to pay for their fair share. And that all stems back to both federal and state law. Um, those, the state law that I mentioned is the Mitigation Fee Act. There are several uh, very clear and very distinct um, elements that have to be looked at and documented as you go through a impact fee process. One of the things, though, that to boil down we have to do is we have to really determine what are existing conditions, what's broken today, or how much more capacity does a roadway facility have? Then we need to try to estimate what are our future deficiencies that may occur as the cities and the county continue to grow. And then we use all the information to then assess and calculate how much new development's fair share of future improvements are. We all have to document this thoroughly as we go through the process to make sure we're meeting the legal intent of the law. When we go through this process of trying to figure out how much uh, new development uh, adds to a, to a roadway project, and with their fair shares, we use a travel demand model. And as Mike mentioned right now, we're updating our travel demand model for the county. We're actually um, expanding the uh, geographic area of the county uh, model that used to look at just South Placer, which is the cities of Lincoln, Roseville, Rockland. Now the model itself will go all the way up to uh, just past the Colfax area. But the model itself is somewhat of a complex calculation, uh, complex uh, collection of calculations and algorithms but it can be boiled down to these three items on your screen. Uh, what trans transportation options do we have? Um, you know, what highways and roadways are nearby? Are, are there commuter buses, local trains? Um, what are the different options that people have? Also, we need to know where our future land use is going, what type of land use. Uh, for example, schools generate most of their trips in the morning um, in the, and then the early afternoon, whereas you know, restaurants, movie theaters generate a lot of their traffic in the evening. So there's differences between how land uses um, generate traffic. And then we also need to know how far are people traveling for their trips and what mode are they using. So I'm gonna try on the next slide uh, to try to kind of illustrate this a little bit better. So here's an example of all of our land uses that we have in a certain area. We include in the model the amount in the location of our commercial spaces, our offices, our homes, our parks, and even our schools. So we take into account all that information. We also 
include all of our major roadways that would connect these land uses and allow people to get to other destinations within the county. We also need to look at where our bike facilities or how much uh, of our residents actually bike to work or maybe bike to tran transit stations. Uh, before the pandemic, we actually had kind of standing room only on some of our commuter buses. And some people did actually ride their bikes to the bus stations. While it's a small percentage of overall Placer County populations, we still need to include this into our travel man model. And then lastly, our transit routes. As I mentioned, uh, we need to include these include these because the more people are riding uh, and utilizing transit, the fewer cars that are on the road. And then when we put all this information to the model, we can test different transportation options. So in this uh, screen on your right here, it's showing the area in blue, which is a new roadway that was added to the travel demand model. What this does is that it helps us to estimate how much more traffic would uh, occur on this new roadway link and what traffic would be diverted as a result of that new roadway. And you can see from the screenshot, the areas in green are where traffic diverted from, areas in pink, whereas where new traffic was attracted to because of this new roadway link. We can also use a traffic demand model to look at fair share, as I mentioned before. So say we have a new development that adds so much traffic to a roadway. Well, we already know from traffic counts how much traffic is on that roadway. And then we also know where its theoretical capacity is, you know, how much traffic can it handle during a given hour. And when we add that new traffic to this roadway, we can see that the new traffic added is only a small percentage of the overall traffic, but that facility is already over capacity, so it's already broke. Well, we can't, because of that, charge the developer to fix the entire thing. We're only allowed by law, the Mitigation Fee Act, to charge them for their fair share of anything over that roadway capacity's limit. So that's how we um, look at different transportation funding options. This is how the development community um, helps contribute to improving our facilities that we have as a result of new development. All right, I'm going to the next part of our presentation um, to kind of put this, you know, take a 30,000 foot view of, of these impact fees um, and, and our investments. So again, $3 billion, that's what we need. Um, about two billion of that three billion, if you add up all these fees uh, that will be generated over the next uh, thirty to forty years, about two billion of that um, is paid for by the by the building or development community. And you know, for every time every time you build a house, every time you build a subdivision, every time you build a square foot of commercial space, you have to pay an impact fee for transportation. It's a system we set up a long time ago. And a very viable source of funding, and, and it pays for two billion. But unfortunately, we have this, you know, nagging one billion that we still have to pay for. And so that's that's the job of of, of PCTPA. But but it's a it's a it's a job that in our entire community has to uh, has to take on because we're all in it together to try to help solve our transportation needs. So if we go to the next slide. You know, I'm going to kind of characterize you. To, what is what is the problem with with that right now? You you, you probably, especially in the south part of the county, uh, and maybe along Highway 49, you kind of see well, well, we're we're a little bit behind in terms of generating those fees, and and certainly, you know, we have to collect the fees and then have enough fees to pay for the improvements. So that's natural, but there actually is a fundamental issue with with. Um, impact fees here in California. And that is in the old days, um, and those old days weren't that long ago, up, to, up until about uh, 12 to 15 years ago, for a, especially for a regional project, um, uh, the understanding and what we kind of planned our communities based upon was that if, if we came up with 10% of the cost, and that's those impact fees, the state and federal government through their various um, funding programs, grants and formula funds, they would pay for nearly 90% of the, the costs. And you know, sometimes that fluctuated between 80 and 90% or 10 or 20% that we'd had to come up with. But that worked actually very well. And we, 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 um, we planned our communities based upon that formula. But again, about 12 years ago, um, things changed and, and, and not for the better, for the worse. And that is, and it's not really, um, in terms of the law changing, the law is still, you still have to come up with this 10 to 20%, depending on the type of program. But what happened is things got a lot more competitive and basically got competitive because things grew and because 
um, you know, those in the state and federal government, um, and a part of it, again, related to, to growth, um, they have many, many priorities that they had to satisfy. And so in order to be, so now today, the, game, the, the name of the game is competitiveness. If you want to get money for your roadway um, through the state or federal government, you have to compete. So not just meet the minimum threshold anymore. You have to compete for those because there's not enough to go around. And so to compete well for those, essentially, you have to come up with dollar for dollar. So 50% of the cost of the program or more sometimes to get that state or federal funding. And, and again, it creates this gap. And that gap relates to that billion dollars that we have to come up with. And we have to be very creative in order to do that. And, you know, 25 other uh, counties in California have uh, over the years come up with a viable source of funding. Uh, that's through a transportation uh, sales tax measure. The state really only gives us two alternatives to come up with those dollars. Um, one is um, a, a parcel tax, but that penalizes all the property owners in the county because we have all these people driving through our community to get to Lake Tahoe or to shop or work in our community and they live somewhere else. So probably, probably we're left with one alternative and that's a, a transportation sales tax measure. And we don't have one here in, in Placer County. We're the biggest county in California without one actually. And so, um, so that's something, you know, we're, we're going to take a look at in the future. We're not really here to tell you tonight. We, 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 you know, we got, we need one, um, but, but we don't have one and we have some, some needs and, and, uh, you know, we may be back to you. Our board's kind of looking at, you know, later this year to kind of look at, well, is, is one of those, um, uh, is there an interest to do that or not? But tonight we're talking about priorities and what should we invest in? So if we move to the next slide, probably your first question is, well, wait a minute. We just, we just approved this thing called the gas tax. Didn't, wasn't that supposed to pay for everything? Didn't we, didn't we, uh, didn't we, didn't our legislators and the Capitol vote for this? And then didn't we have a recall election? And it was, and it was, um, uh, of course, very controversial here in Placer County. But, but wasn't it reaffirmed? And, and so, don't we have this gas tax that we pay every day in our at the pump for things? And, and the answer is yes, we do have the gas tax. But the answer, the other answer is no. Does it pay for everything? What it does pay for is it, it helps us pay for what we have already, or a thing called fix it first. And so, and that's very important because we have a big backlog of potholes and streets that need to be reconstructed and pedestrian safety issues to, to solve. Um, and in some of the worst, uh, and there is money in there in some of the, the most congested areas of the state around, mainly around our seaports um, that, uh, uh, that there is a very small amount of money for, for congestion relief. But, but for the most part, most counties in California are on their own when it comes to paying for planned expansion of our transportation facilities. So the planned expansion of, of Highway 49 to six lanes cannot be, we cannot use the gas tax for that. And it's unfortunate because um, it took a long time for the state to kind of come up with this gas tax, you know, almost 17 years to, 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 uh, to, to decide to do this, but they only funded, they only fixed half of the problem, even though the state and, and especially our county is growing like crazy. Um, we don't really have uh, a, a um, the gas tax does not pay for that at all, unfortunately. So, so uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit more tonight is, well, what, firstly is, well, what would happen if we did, um, if we did have a source of funding for our projects. And we, uh, I'm gonna give you just a couple of, or one or two examples here of, if we did have funding for it, what could we do? And so the first project is actually, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, is in the south part of our county. And uh, we were just successful at getting $62 million um, for a many, many uh, priority projects, both in Sacramento County um, and Placer County. Um, and, to, and some important projects here in Placer County um, uh, we included a new, uh, a new bus route from Lincoln to Roseville and then down to the light rail station. Uh, we, we got some money for a, the Dry Creek Trail system in Roseville. We got uh, a couple of highway improvements uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, along Interstate 80. And then Sacramento County got a bunch of their stuff uh, uh, funded um, uh, from uh, mainly around uh, the Watt Avenue light rail station. But, but how did we do this? Um, you know, certainly we didn't have enough matching funds um, for our projects 
but what we did is we kind of we we rode on the coattails of Sacramento County. They have actually a thing called Measure B, which um, which uh, was a sales tax measure approved a number of years ago, and they were able to overmatch their projects. So when you added all these projects together, um, we we kind of used their match, if you will, their matching funds to fund our to help balance our projects and group our projects and get it funded. Um, not something we're going to be able to do very much, but you can see that you know the the message here is. If we do have matching funds, there is funding for these projects, either at the state level or, as you probably heard a lot about it, the, the national level, um, the, the Biden administration is looking at a $2 trillion infrastructure measure. And everybody you know, gets excited about that and goes, oh, you know, that's going to solve all of our problems. Well, yes. And well, it's not going to solve all of our problems, but um, is it a viable source of money for, for transportation infrastructure? Yes. But the problem still lies in that we have to come up with a 50% match to, in order to do that, to, to make it competitive, um, to get to tap into those dollars. So let's go on to the next, uh, and, and maybe the main part of it. Well, actually, and here's the, here's the um, auxiliary lane projects that we, we got funded out of those projects. The last two bottlenecks down there on Interstate 80 in the south part of the county. One is um, a, a fifth lane from uh, Douglas to Riverside. And then in the other direction, uh, going towards Sierra College from the interchange to Rockland Road, very congested area that uh, when Sierra College is in, in session, it's very difficult to get from uh, the, the Roseville area per se, you know, up into uh, uh, Sierra College. So we, saw, we were able to solve that very, very important project for Placer County here. So. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of our projects here in the county. And, and, you know, we're up in the Auburn area today talking to you. And, and so we're not going to focus too much on the south part of the county. Um, but I'll just quickly mention, you know, we got a lot of big, important projects down there. You all go down there to shop and, and, and work um, and enjoy things down in the, you know, the Roseville, Rockland, Lincoln area. And so we have a bunch of projects down there from widening Highway 65 to fixing the interchange to fixing baseline Riego Road, um, uh, the auxiliary lanes I just mentioned, we just got those funded. Uh, and then a new, actually a brand new roadway called Placer Parkway, which goes from uh, uh, Whitney Ranch Parkway on 65 near uh, Rockland, all the way over to uh, Highway uh, 99 in Sutter County. So lots of big projects down there in the south part of the county. But tonight, again, because we're in Auburn, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, things happening up in Auburn. So if we go to the next slide, one of the big things that we're, we're, we've uh, begun working on this year is, and, and very important um, to the safety of Highway, is the safety of Highway 49. Highway 49, we've had a number of, of uh, fatal collisions, um, a number of uh, pedestrian accidents along that roadway, and uh, so much so that um, Caltrans has placed a very, very high priority on uh, this roadway. And so, um, this is something normally done in a more urban section, but what it's going to do is it's going to essentially open us up to um, to plan better for this roadway comprehensively with Placer County uh, and uh, and and um, Nevada County. Um, but it's going to be able to open again, get us a better chance to get funding for things like barrier separated medians uh, north of Auburn. Um, some new uh, uh, intersection improvements um, um, and uh, roundabouts and that type of thing, signalization improvements, um, paving improvements, but things really to address safety. And, and I'm sorry, this is a pretty small map, but we're, we're, we're instead of kind of looking at area by area and making little fixes, we're going to make we're going to try to endeavor to make big fixes to this roadway and Caltrans, uh, the District 3 of Caltrans, is making this one of their priority corridors um, to, to address these safety issues. Because again, it's, it's, it's uh, to a point where it's, it's just not acceptable. Um, we, we have to do something seriously about it. And so we're looking from way up in Nevada County, up by Highway 20, um, all the way down to Interstate 80 and, and looking at a, a number of uh, very, very important projects in here. Um, if you go to the next slide, the first thing we're doing is we're actually doing a safety audit. So we're looking at, well, what is, we're defining what is the problem. And that's just done. Um, if you want to go to our, uh, our departmental website, um, which is pctpa.net, right on the front page, there's a connection to this document, the safety audit. And what it's doing is taking a look at long-term projects and short-term projects um, to be able to, uh, to, to be able to, uh, 
um, things that we should address on the quarter again in this comprehensive manner, as opposed to just kind of doing project little project by little project and, and not really getting a lot done we're focusing on big big items and big priorities to make this a safer corridor. If we could go to the next slide Aaron. Um, but, but you know it's not just about the highway system and when we and we you know at PCTPA we, we have a big focus uh, on the highway system. But it's just as important um, to get to that highway system um, as it is to uh, to get to other parts in your community. And so, our priorities um, again, we have member agencies uh, in the in this area. We have two member agencies that we work very closely with: the City of Auburn and the uh, and the and the and Placer County. And in the City of Auburn. Um, this slide illustrates that they have a number of different priorities that we're working very closely with them on. These come right out of the city's capital improvement plan. And, uh, and I know that uh, the city's uh, going to be over the next uh, number of months uh, updating this capital improvement program. Um, but, but some really important projects, you know, some, some really key roadway projects. Um, I mentioned, you know, the first two on Highway 49, but things like expanding the uh, the Auburn train station, uh, again, a very um, viable uh, use uh, for our people that commute or travel to the to the Bay Area or to Sacramento, uh, very important, um, and in uh, a number of other uh, overlay projects and road, road rehabilitation projects uh, right here in the city of Auburn. And then in Placer County, um, we we have a number uh, many projects, of course, um, um, throughout the Auburn area. If we go to the next slide, Aaron, um, um, which which most of them are, are roadway um, rehabilitation projects or reconstruction projects. Again, fixing our roads. Um, a lot of our roads have you know unsafe curvature. Um, have uh, need to be widened in certain sections. Um, need um, uh, I think so we talked about earlier. Uh, some signalization improvements, you know, coordination of our signals um, needs to be done. So you can see there's a, a, a pretty, pretty big list here, um, you know, of, of roadways that need to be improved here uh, in the in the greater Air, Auburn area or North Auburn area. And we're working very closely with uh, Placer County Public Works uh, Department um, and and the Board of Supervisors and the County Executive's Office to try to find a way to uh, to fund these projects and get these projects built again, because it, it gets people to our regional roadways and then to other places, but we have to make sure that we can get people around our community in safe ways. And, and I listed the, we listed these projects here tonight again to kind of spark the discussion um, of what do you think? I mean, these are the projects that our, our towns and our cities have, have planned right here in Auburn. Is there something that we're missing? Is there something that we're leaving out? Is there a roadway that you think is more important than another roadway? So we'd, we'd love to hear from you again in this. Uh, again, put it in the chat box or, or we'll talk about this in a minute uh, in our open session. So if we go to the next slide. Um, one of the really important projects that we are working on, and, and actually we got funded, um, and, it, and I think it's pr probably still the largest um, ATP project, maybe, maybe it's the second largest now, in the entire Sacramento region. All, ATP is code word for Alternative Transportation Program, or Bike and Pedestrian Facilities, really. Um, uh, as you know, right now, Highway 49 is, is undergoing a big um, uh, rehabilitation by Caltrans. And so um, they're out there rehabilitating the roadway, fixing little issues all the way from um, uh, Dry Creek all the way down to Interstate 80. Um, well, when that project's done, and that's a $55 million project, um, PCTPA came in and they said, well, there's still gaps in our sidewalks. There's, there's no continuous walkway along this corridor, you know, it's it's a former highway corridor that, you know, way, way back when they didn't really plan very well for bikes and pedestrians. Um, and so we were able to go and convince the state of California to give us uh, $14.4 million to essentially do, fix that. And so we will, um, um, this project is actually in final design right now. Aaron is actually the project manager of this project. Um, and our uh, engineering uh, company, Wood Rogers Engineering, is, is uh, in uh, the almost the final design stage and right-of-way stage for that project. And we're hopeful to bring this project to construction uh, in 2022. So right on the heels of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Caltrans project to really fix the, the sidewalk um, and, and pedestrian system in here. And then one little unique part of this project too is um, 
you know, when we when we put these sidewalks in, the community hasn't had these types of facilities in a very long time. And we have a, a lot of schools and, and other facilities along this area um, to to um, that you know, all of a sudden we're going to build these things. Well, we got to make sure that they use them. And so we've actually, um, uh, we're actually working with the school districts in the area uh, and, uh, and Placer County um, to do a, a training program on, on how, to, how you can actually, instead of getting in your car and taking your kids to school, you could actually walk to get to those schools. Again, not now, but once those those sidewalk and, and, and roadway improvements are put in. So there's a, a component of that um, to, uh, again, get people out of their cars. Um, the next uh, slide we have here, um, if we could advance, uh, Aaron, um, is our, uh, I'm gonna move from roadways and, and things on the roadway to, to non-roadway things. So again, I, our bike, uh, we started out with a sidewalk project, but our bicycle and trail networks, and sometimes they're on the roads like the sidewalk gap closure project, but a lot of times they're on minor streets and or they're off the streets entirely. And so in this area, we have two uh, local networks um, that are that are uh, um, uh, that are uh, trying to connect people and get people to where they want to go without again getting in the car. And so on the left side of this slide, is the city of Auburn's uh, bikeway plan, uh, which we worked uh, back in uh, 2012 very closely with the city of Auburn um, to uh, to get them uh, uh, to plan for their bicycle network. And then on the right side of the screen is a brand new plan. In fact, so brand new, it's only a draft plan right now, which is uh, the county is doing a new uh, pedestrian and trails master plan for the whole county. But a big part of that is right here in Auburn to connect to things like the, the Hidden Falls, a trail system and other regional trail systems. So again, two very, very important projects that we're trying to help um, Auburn and, and Placer County um, for the, well, they're planning for these, but then to help them find a viable source of funding for these uh, very uh, key projects or key networks. Um, and then what we're trying to do is take, go from the local level to the regional level. So, you know, we, again, we wanted to get, we want to do our best, you know, a lot of people drive in Placer County, but to the extent we can, we want to get people out of their, out of their vehicles, either to commute or, you know, even just to enjoy um, our beautiful county here in Placer County. And so we're trying to connect our, our cities together. So we're trying to connect Auburn, you know, to, to Ofer, to Penryn, to, to the lower parts of our county on a, on, a, on bicycle networks. We're trying to connect Lincoln to Roseville and so on to, to get these bicycle networks to be a viable source of getting to where you wanna go and to enjoy our community. Um, it's not just about commuting, um, it's about getting to those beautiful places here in Placer County as well and recreating in Placer. And, you know, of course, with uh, all of our not being at work during the pandemic, we were, we kind of were, were able to reflect back on these systems and we've never had so many people utilize our, our bicycle and pedestrian systems that we did during the pandemic, which, you know, I view as a, a good thing because we appreciate these and, and maybe we'll invest more in these uh, important uh, different modes of transportation. And then finally on, on, on our, our bicycle network is we're trying to build these even larger regional trail systems. So we're, again, here in Placer, we're trying to connect our trails, but then we're trying to connect these things to even, even a larger regional scale. And, you know, everybody's heard of the American River Parkway. It's a beautiful um, uh, bicycle pedestrian trail that connects Folsom Lake all the way down to downtown Sacramento. Um, you know, over two and a half million people use this uh, very beautiful facility every year. Well, we're trying to do the same thing in Placer County. So first we connect our communities together, but then we're gonna have a trail that goes from Granite Bay to Roseville and then down into, into Sacramento County and connect into that American River bike trail system, eventually down into downtown Sacramento via Alberta and Rio Linda, that Dry Creek Greenway. So in, in, in our part of Placer County, we are, we are actually building a version of the uh, American River bike trail to have this great loop network someday here in, in the Sacramento region, something that, you know, when we look at other regions that have this already um, and is very well utilized, uh, places like Seattle and Portland and, and other parts of our nation um, that have these wonderful recreational facilities for bicycles and pedestrians. Next slide. A lot of what we do though, so those are big plans. A lot of what we do though, is we fill gaps. And this is just a part, a, a snapshot of one part of our community, but a lot of times, 
what we have these disjoint, you know, we, we build these things or a, a, a developer builds a subdivision and he builds one part of the bike trail and then, you know, a mile away, another subdivision is built and he builds his, he or she builds their part of the bike trail. Um, but what happens is there's a gap in between and we spend a lot of our time filling these gaps so we have these connected systems. And so, um, you know, one, one of the things everybody thinks, well, bicycle trails, it's not that hard. You know, it's, you know, it's just got to be easier than building a roadway. Well, a lot of times it's not because we want these facilities, uh, especially the ones that are off um, the, the roadway, they're usually in our, our more pristine parts of the community. We like to put these things along creeks and, and other beautiful places. Well, then we run into issues such as private property um, issues. We have environmental issues because you're putting it near the creek. And so a lot of times these are very, very difficult and, and expensive projects. Not, you know, they're worthwhile because they're, again, building these beautiful bike trails in our community, but, but very, very, very difficult and sometimes very, very costly. But we spend a lot of our, our time uh, doing these as well. So then we're going to talk a little bit about the last, the last part of our presentation. And I have the last mode, if you will, is transit. And so we have here in Placer County, three transit systems. We have, um, and I'll start at the south part of the county, we have Roseville Transit, if we go to the next slide, which is, serves the city of Roseville. Um, and we have Placer County Transit, which connects our communities like Lincoln and Rockland, and, and there's their transit provider, and also provides access all the way up to Auburn and uh, all the way up uh, Highway 49, uh, and connects our communities. And then we have Auburn Transit, which is which serves um, uh, the city uh, in and around the city of Auburn. And these transit is very very difficult in Placer County, and these transit operators are very small operations, but but they try very very hard to to build a transit or to operate a transit system in, in what is mostly a suburban location. And you know, transit systems in urban areas, I wouldn't say they're easy to run, but but they have kind of a built-in clientele because you have a, a very high density uh, environment where where it makes transit very viable to use. When when you have such a spread out development pattern in Placer County, um, it makes transit very, very difficult. And, and so we, we're working constantly with our operators to try to improve our systems uh, we have here in Placer County. Um, if we go to the next slide, one of, one of the, the most ridden services, however, in Placer County, and Aaron touched upon this a little bit in his uh, traffic uh, uh, presentation, is commuter buses. Our commuter buses, whether they're from Auburn down to the light rail station or from Roseville and Rockland, and Lincoln down to downtown Sacramento um, for you know, where you know, the largest employer in the region is, these buses are full. Well, prior to the pandemic, of course, these buses are full to the brim. In fact, uh, in some cases, if you're not on that first stop where that bus goes, you are standing all the way sometimes to light rail station or downtown Sacramento. And so, you know, in terms of what investing in what works this this again prior to the pandemic and we're going to have to go through a process to reconvince people that this is a, a viable use and you know maybe with things like the cdc decision today it'll come back a, a little quicker but 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 we you know these are very very viable and, and and investing in these makes good sense because they're very very well utilized um and then we um if we go to the next slide um the last part of our transportation system are what we call door-to-door -door services. And those are our dial-a-ride systems. And again, our, our, our same transit operators have uh, a dial-a-ride system. Roswell has a dial-a-ride system. Placer has a dial-a-ride system. Auburn is a little different. It has kind of a dial-a-ride built into it because it's a normal bus route. And then it, uh, and then it deviates. So if you wanna call the bus um, uh, near your house or near where you're gonna go, um, they'll actually deviate their route to get to get as close as they can to you. Um, and then we have another system which used to be called My Rides, um, which, which would connect you. If you, had a, if you were a senior or disabled person and you had a medical appointment um, in the county and didn't have the means to get there, um, we actually have a service that would, uh, well, it used to be two services, a bus service uh, and a volunteer ride service um, that would help get you to those medical facilities, both here in Placer and also in Sacramento County. We are actually converting that system to a new thing called Placer Rides, um, which is uh, uh, an all volunteer system. So if you have a, 
uh, a friend or a loved one that needs to get to uh, their medical appointment, say at Kaiser Morse down in, in Sacramento, and you live in Auburn, um, and they don't have any means to 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 get there, um, uh, we had, we were we're converting the system to where we will actually reimburse you at the um, the IRS mileage right um, up to a capped amount to get you there and to get you back, and so that's uh, a very important thing that we're uh, um, that that's uh, that helps those that are less. Uh, fortunate to be able to get to their medical appointments. And then lastly, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, we're going we're to try something new called microtransit. I'll, I'll get to that after this slide here. So the problem, again, commuter buses, they work really well. Um, they get people to, 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 to major employers uh, here in the, or to, to um, light rail systems here in the Sacramento region. Local service, however, because of our, our, our spread out development pattern is, is very challenged. And we're not the only ones, you know. Um, you can see here from this graph that over the last 10 years, local buses, the ridership is, has decreased greatly um, to a point where it's, it's uh, you know, not really sustainable. And so, you know, our transit operators, even before COVID said, well, you know, we have to try something else. This is not working. And then COVID came along and essentially our, our transit systems went over the cliff and no one is, is riding them right now. And it's going to be difficult because people, you know, have now switched to cars to get them to come back to you know, essentially to something that isn't working very well. Now there's reasons people aren't, aren't, aren't riding transit. You know, we actually make it very easy to purchase an automobile. You know, you can finance the things for, you know, eight years with $0 down, even on a used car, you can do that now. And so we made it super easy to, 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 um, to buy a car. We can't do much about that, but we, what we can do is, is make it easier for people to use transit. You know, we've historically in the last 25 years created these meander, especially in suburban locations, these meandering bus routes that go in these big circles throughout our community. They take an hour to get there. And then if you miss the bus, then it's another hour. And then on the way back, you know, maybe an hour or two hours, and it takes you all day to what would normally take you a 10 minute car ride. And so what happens is people don't use it. So we're going to try to do something about that to try to make that more convenient to the user. And so we're going to try something new called micro transit. And we've gotten together with all of our transit uh, systems uh, uh, here in the county, and, and we're going to try this on a pilot basis. Placer County, we don't like to do new trans transportation things. We don't like to be on the bleeding edge. So, so because um, we'd rather have someone else, you know, make those mistakes and, uh, and uh, for things that are not very viable or, or very new, but, but this is not new anymore. We have these micro transit systems virtually all over Sacramento now. Um, we have very successful ones in West Sacramento and Citrus Heights and some other areas. And, and what the concept here is instead of, you know, these meandering bus routes, essentially just like Uber and Lyft, you use your smartphone or you call them and that bus will come directly to you and then it will take you directly to where you want to go. Now, not by yourself. It's not a taxi service, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of a combination of super shuttle, if you remember that, coming home from the airport, um, and uh, Uber and Lyft. So you and, you know, five or six other people um, will get to where you want to go directly um, instead of, again, taking an hour. So instead of an hour, it might take you 15 or 20 minutes to where you want to go. Again, much quicker, much more convenient, and 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 apt to be used very much. Citrus Heights started with two of these buses, um, and they're smaller buses too. They're cutaways, um, which is the vehicle on the top left, or even down to even vans. They started with two of these, and and they they've expanded now to twelve of these for their community. It's so popular. So we're going to try this here in Placer County, and uh, actually. Um, Auburn, you know, one of our smaller towns in the region, um, they're always, uh, their transit system is, is small, but, and so it's able to make these changes very quickly, and, and, uh, and, and it, they will probably be the first ones to try this, and um, I don't know, John, you know, you, you, you popped on your screen there, do you want to, you want to say a little bit about, uh, a little bit about this pilot project you may be trying out here pretty soon, it's not set in stone or anything yet, but, but something uh, Auburn's going to try out here, hopefully. You bet. No, it uh, actually, uh, we're going to do the soft rollout starting tomorrow. We have two programs. Oh, okay. One is going to be a fixed route going down into the uh, confluence uh, to some of the trailheads down there. Um, uh, we're, 
doing a little bit of uh, shoot ready aim on this, but uh, we're going to work uh, the, the logistics uh, of that. So look for us to do a special route going down in the confluence. But the second thing probably rolling out in July will be a demand system, exactly like the microtransit that you've talked about. Uh, we have been working with a company out of uh, Indianapolis that uh, has an on-demand app that we're gonna publish uh, and get out to everybody. And it's gonna work exactly like you just described. Uh, we're gonna roll that out in uh, uh, July. And uh, we think it's gonna work great. Uh, it, it's funny, you show the different types of buses uh, that or uh, vehicles that we're gonna use. We're looking into all of that. But uh, we think it's gonna be a, a model that uh, we're, everybody can both learn from and try to exemplify, but uh, look for us to roll these things out over the, the next uh, couple of months. And <clears throat> the bottom line, we're going to try and look at all of the ways of kind of revolutionizing how public transit works. Uh, right now, our ridership is, is uh, very low, and uh, it, it behooves us to look at other alternatives. We certainly think that the on-demand system uh, will, will really play out. So uh, stay tuned and uh, uh, look for details as, as we get them out. Great, thank you, John. So yeah, we're gonna try this. Uh, you know, Auburn's gonna be the first out of the gate, you know, um, and, and I, I gotta hand it to Auburn. Their, 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 their transit system is very nimble. They're probably, they will be the first uh, of our transit systems to electrify. So there are these vehicles that uh, very soon are gonna be electric vehicles um, for our buses um, and way ahead of our other transit systems. Again, it's, you know, it's cause they're smaller but they're very nimble, agile organization and um, run by John and his staff. We're also gonna take a look at this. Uh, there's another pilot coming out here very soon and that's up in the, in the Tahoe region. Um, the Placer County and uh, Placer County Transit is expanding what's uh, what was a microtransit service in Olympic Valley. Um, they're now expanding that to include uh, for the summer as a pilot project, uh, microtransit that would include uh, both the west and north shores of Lake Tahoe. And then the rest of the county, um, we're, we're actually, uh, yeah, it's a little more complicated because they're bigger. Um, we're actually looking at some areas to do a pilot project in Lincoln. Uh, Rockland and the eastern part of Roseville and maybe the central part of, of Roseville as well. So uh, again, a little bit bigger endeavor, but we're, we're starting that process as well. And, and, and we're going to try it. You know, we're going to try it for a pilot period to see if it works. If it works, great. You know, we, this may be a direction we move like, like many other people in the, in the many other communities. We may redesign our transit system. So, so we have um, you know, spine routes that go down our major corridors, like like in Auburn Highway 49, we keep the bus route on Highway 49, but then we have the micro transit kind of feeding into that. So we're we're looking at our systems comprehensively, and we have to. You know, local ridership is is uh, was was down severely before the pandemic, and 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 before people we get people to come back we have to we have to upgrade it and and try something different because what we had is is not working so um so if we go to the next slide the last part of our um our transit system is our inner inner city rail system so you you may or may not know that uh we have in our midst here uh, again kind of be before the pandemic the third most popular inner city rail system in the entire united states right here in, uh, as it originates right here in Placer County, and that's the capital corridors that go from, from the Auburn station um, all the way down to, uh, to San Jose. Um, and we have some super commuters right here in, uh, in, in, the, in the city of Auburn that uh, regularly travel all the way down to uh, Silicon Valley um, to their jobs in, in, in and around San Jose. Um, every day um, to uh, to to uh, to use that service and 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 you know again save hundreds and thousands of, of vehicle miles by doing that and so um, what we're going to be doing over the next uh, number of years is trying to expand that service and I have some good news and, and some not so good news so um, that rail line and I actually every rail line virtually in the, in uh, in Northern California um, is owned by um, Union Pacific Railroad, the freight railroad. And so it's their railroad. And, and we have to get their permission to use that. And they have um, 
rights that date back to the 1850s that have been tested time and time again uh, by the Supreme Court. And, and so without their permission, them granting their permission, there is actually no way um, to force them to, uh, to let us use our railroad. So they have let us use their railroad for, for the first phase of the capital quarter. And that's what we have now all the way to Auburn, one trip a day per, to Auburn, um, which stops also in Roseville and Rockland uh, along its way. But we'd like to expand this because it's very, very successful. And a lot of folks in here in Placer want to use it more and they want to have more trains. Um, certainly we have buses that connect to uh, down to Sacramento, but we need more, we'd like more train service. And so we have a plan to expand initially to three trains uh, and then eventually um, to 10 trains in each direction. So that'd be, that'd be actually six trains and 20 trains. Um, but, um, but it's complicated and it's, and, it's, and it's costly and it's complicated because UP owns it. And so we are initially going to expand those, those trips to Roseville because they are allowing us to build another track to get to Roseville. Um, and, and, but what our hope is, is that over time, we'll be able to, to ask UP permission to expand that up to Auburn. So it's not a, a today or tomorrow, it's probably, you know, a, a, you know, quite a few years after that, but you gotta start somewhere. And so we're initially starting with our trips to Roseville, and then hopefully over time we'll be able to get maybe not, you know, all those trips to Auburn, but uh, but hopefully you know a a, a, le a somewhat lesser number uh, all the way up to Auburn over time. But again, we we got to start somewhere, and we're starting with uh, with trips to Roseville, and we are working very hard um, to try to get uh, more trips up to Auburn. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight. But as we close, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Supervisor Gustafson and uh, Council. Uh, member Amara to maybe say a few closing uh, remarks here before we close tonight. Well, Sandy, I'll jump in. I just, again, thank uh, all the people who attended, but boy, Mike, I, I want to echo what Bridget said and what others said in the chat. What an engaging presentation you and staff did. Um, I, as you know, have spent the last year and a half in Zoom meetings, and I don't think anyone has been as effective as this one um, and really boiling down a lot of great information for the community and a lot of great ways for them to engage. And we have a lot to learn from you, <laughs> but thank great you. job. And I really want to thank everyone. This is such an important part of our future uh, and our safety, our health and safety, and our quality of life. Uh, and so thanks for participating. I look forward to continuing to work with everyone to move this forward. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you all also. The presentation was wonderful. The engaging aspect made it very, um, very exciting for everybody. And, um, and I really enjoyed everybody's participation and hearing different aspects here, especially the projects. We have a lot of exciting projects and plans and very exciting. And Auburn looks forward to doing what we can to help out so that we can implement all these wonderful plans and projects. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Supervisor Gustafson and Council Member Amara and, and everybody else that came tonight. And again, I just wanna emphasize that tonight's doesn't have to be the end of this uh, uh, engagement with you about transportation. If there's something you, uh, you, uh, you think of uh, later on tonight or tomorrow, um, by all means, you can contact uh, myself, Aaron or Kathleen uh, or your council members or supervisor members. And we'd love to talk to you more about transportation 